Thanks very much for uh, coming to tonight's uh, opening session of the 33rd Greaves School. Uh, just a couple of announcements beforehand. Uh, we have produced a pamphlet, two uh, essays, lectures, uh, one by Desmond Greaves and the other one by Padre O'Donnell on <coughs> Liam Mellows. And they're for sale at the uh, at the door at three euros. They're excellent. Uh, they're excellent essays and uh, well worth well, well, well worth uh, buying. Um, <coughs> my name's Kevin McCurry, and for my sins, I'm the director of the school. Uh, and before handing over to the person who's going to chair tonight's session, there's obviously a change, there's a different chair. And Karen Devine was to chair tonight's session. And unfortunately she's got, she's ill, and quite seriously ill, and we, 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 we wish her well. And Ray Bassett very, very generously stepped into her place and is going to chair uh, tonight's, tonight's session. Uh, and I'm going to say a, a bit more about Ray uh, later on in, in, in these remarks. Now, tonight's session, the heading of the set uh, for the session is In Defence of the Nation State. And some time ago, Thomas Fozzi wrote with Bill Mitchell uh, a quite seminal uh, book called um, uh, Reclaiming the State, in which both uh, Thomas and uh, Bill presented a very compelling argument uh, uh, as to why uh, reclaiming the state and democratic uh, sovereignty today is absolutely necessary. They proclaim that the struggle for national sovereignty is back on the agenda. Thus, for the Irish context, the mainstream Republican objectives of Irish national democracy and sovereignty, far from being part of some political and intellectual backwater, in fact remains in the vanguard of the international struggle for human progress. And that's a message that the school and its all over the years has tried to uh, pre 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 present. So we are pleased and happy that what Thomas is arguing, and which will be expanding tonight, is something that we have uh, ourselves have, have, have uh, tried to advance. The nation state remains the only vehicle for progressive change because it is the one alone that contains the resources for the democratic control of na nation's economy and its finances. Now Thomas is going to expand and much more uh, than, than, than the, what I've said. So I just want to uh, a few comments about Ray and why he is particularly equipped to be chairing tonight's uh, session. The, the headline about Ray is a former senior Irish diplomat and participant in the Northern Peace Process. And he served as Irish ambassador to Canada, Jamaica, and uh, the Bahamas. But I think his claim that his, his most satisfying part of his work 
at that time was his participation in the Northern peace process up to and including the final nego nego negotiations. Uh, and uh, the role that he played there uh, has to be appreciated and, 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 and remembered. And we certainly uh, would uh, do it. So, without further ado, I'll hand you over to Ray uh, to chair tonight's session. Thank you. Yes. Um, Firstly, I'm obviously not Karen um, Devine, and uh, before I go on to that, I just want to say to wish Karen a speedy recovery. I have a great deal of respect for Karen Devine. She's been an outstanding uh, advocate of Irish neutrality, at the defence of Irish neutrality, and she's done superb academic work, particularly about how our um, maritime resources have been plundered, at, uh, and our government have done virtually nothing to, um, to save it or to get us a reasonable share. Her work is terrific. Now, she is also somebody who stands by her convictions and if people who are, who are familiar with, with um, anyway, uh, I particularly wanted to pay a tribute to Karen uh, because, as I say, in Irish academia, the way you get on is essentially, the same as a lot of the, the public service, is to be a conformist, and Karen has always stood by her her, uh, her convictions and by her research, and she has uh, shown up the groupthink of many people in the university sector. So I just want to put that in record, uh, and it's a yeah. privilege. Yeah. Uh, however, my main um, function here tonight is a very straightforward one, and that's namely to introduce our distinguished guest, Thomas Fazzi. Uh, and it's one I do with great deal of ple pleasure. And I commend the school on getting such a distinguished um, guest for, as your main speaker here this evening. Um, Thomas is speaking on the topic of the defense of the nation state. And this is a, a very appropriate venue, obviously, um, for that speech, the home of the former home of the Pierce family, where two of the sons, obviously, Pollock and Willie, were executed by the British authorities because of their activities and the promotion of the in the establishment of a nation state here on this island. It seems an awful pity that some of our present leaders seem hell-bent on the destruction of nation states in Europe, uh, including our own, and to replace them by this new uh, version of a member state of a larger grouping, neither totally sovereign <coughs> nor totally part of a federation, a kind of halfway existence. Now, I've met Thomas before. We were both speakers at a conference at the LSE in London, organized by Peter Ramsey, on the issue of not national sovereignty in the post-Brexit period. Uh, and I, my job was to talk about the implications for Ireland. And Thomas was spoke on Italy. And I can tell you, <coughs> we're in for a very good uh, presentation tonight. He was probably the most impressive speaker at that conference. I, I, like Kevin, I actually came across Thomas first as the co-author of the book, Reclaiming the State, a progressive vision of sovereignty for a post-neoliberal world, which he co-authored with William um, Mitchell, which obviously made the case that the <coughs> state is the greatest de um, defender, the nation state is the greatest defender of, uh, and really the only defender in the long run of democratic values and democracy itself. Uh, his, uh, his, uh, his other work, the battle, uh, the, uh, one of his other works, was because Thomas has a very long list of achievements after his name. The Battle for Europe, how an elite hijacked the continent and how, we, and how we can take it back. And that was published in 2014. These are very, very important works. And they're about issues which should be discussed much, in much greater detail and much more frequency throughout uh, Europe. Uh, Thomas is, of course, uh, known to a lot of people here as a regular contra contributor to Unheard, the British Opinion uh, and News website. Uh, the title of that site is very apt here in Ireland, as the media in this state is determined that those who don't agree with the official narrative shall remain as much as possible unheard. I must say, I would it's, it's partly excuse the, mor the main morning paper in Belfast than the Irish News, which is better, not, not perfect or anything. I cover in a, way, a range of views, particularly those who are against the government uh, on issues such as uh, joining NATO or slavishly following what 
uh, all what, what, what Brussels wants of this country. My friend Michael Clark, who's here tonight, is fond of calling our paper a record as the Ivy House Bulletin. <laughs> and uh, such is their ability to uh, reproduce uh, the views of my former employer, uh, the Department of Foreign Affairs. There's a lot of truth in Michael's quip. Um, and you know, we, we, we are getting such a, a partial view of the world. Um, I've just come back um, from my son's wedding in Cairo, and there were 25 of us travelled out from Ireland, all with different backgrounds, uh, including some who had originated in Poland. Uh, and one thing we all said when we were getting back towards the end, throughout our time there, and some spent up to a week and a half, two weeks, nobody saw a Ukrainian flag, nobody saw any declaration. And it is clear that in the contest for influence in, in, BRIC, in the BRICS, and of course Egypt is now joining the BRICS, the West, or Europe in particular, is losing influence. Uh, and that's virtually unreported in our local media. Um, Thomas's article on how America controls um, Europe, which Tony Cotlin sent to me recently, is well worth a read. We need a real discussion in this state on our future and on the future of whether we want to maintain to stay as a as a sovereign state or whether we are got, prepared to to slip um, without protest into this conf this amorphous confederation that that may be coming up. And particularly, this is important, particularly at a time when the government is seeking to outlaw a lot of free speech in what's known as the hate speech bill, which is a disguised attack on civil and political rights in this country. And it's taken our human rights people a long time to wake up and actually to read what's in that bill. Hopefully, our Supreme Court will declare it unconstitutional in line what seems to be um, the freedom of speech parts of our constitution. Therefore, events such as tonight are very important in stimulating debate. And again, I want to, com to congratulate Kevin and the committee for attracting such a well-known international figure as Thomas. Now, Thomas is Italian. As I was saying to him earlier, I now have in-laws in, uh, through my son in Italy, and I'd be very interested if you, at some stage, you touch on Italian politics and development in Italy, which are of very great interest, but that's a purely a personal. How much time do you have? <laughs> <laughs> now, my job here is like a, a referee in a GA match, which is to throw the ball and get out of the way. <laughs> uh, to say there are, there are no co stars here, only supporting acts, and Thomas is the star. So, uh, there will be ample uh, time at the end for discussion and questions. Um, so, it is with undisting, undisguised pleasure that I call on Thomas to take the floor as the um, Well, thank you, um, Ray, for a flattering introduction. Um, and thank you, Kevin. Um, I think you might have created excessive expectations. Uh, so, uh, um, and obviously, thanks to the, uh, Desmond Breeze uh, Summer School for inviting me. It's a real pleasure to be here. I've already met some amazing people. So, it's, uh, I haven't even started, and it's already been an amazing. Um, an amazing event for me. So uh, really, thanks a lot. I'm honored to be here today. Um, so I'm gonna be talking from here, if you don't mind, because I've got a few notes down on my computer. Um, so, yeah, the nation state. Um, so I assume if you're here today at the Desmond Greaves Summer School, uh, which is named after one of the uh, left thinkers that more than any other emphasized the importance of national sovereignty, um, and the nation state from a left and a socialist perspective, then you probably, I imagine, already know uh, why national sovereignty is important, uh, why the anti-sovereign and anti-national project that is the European Union is a big um, problem, um, especially from a you know from a democratic perspective in general, but especially from a left and a socialist um, perspective. So. I won't waste too much time kind of restating the case or the left case for national sovereignty in kind of general the terms. Um, rather, I'd like to reflect on what the events of the past years, in the kind of past 15 years in general, but especially uh, the pandemic and then the war in Ukraine, what they tell us about the concrete effects that this loss of sovereignty, as a result, first and foremost, of the process of European integration, have, ha have had in the countries and nations of Europe. So first I'll just kind of go over the basics of um, 
the left case for national sovereignty that we lay out in, in our book. So in very basic terms, uh, you can't have democracy, you can't have popular sovereignty in the true sense of the word if you don't have national sovereignty. And I think it's quite easy to see why. If by democracy we mean the ability of citizens to have a say on issues that really matter, to have a say on the political, social, and economic organization of society, on fundamental issues which affect the actual material living conditions of people, of workers, rather than simply limiting themselves to tinker the edges of policy, uh, such as, for example, you know, debating about what pronouns we should use in addressing our fellow citizens and things of the sort. Um, well, then it goes without saying that the state within which the electoral democratic process takes place needs to have a certain degree of economic uh, and especially monetary sovereignty. That is to say that it needs to have those basic tools that are necessary to steer the economy in one direction or another. Um, and those basic tools are the tools, are the traditional tools of economic policy, fiscal policy, tax policy, exchange rate policy, but most of all, monetary policy, and that is the ability to issue one's own currency, which really kind of undergirds all the other tools of economic policy. And these are the tools from which every aspect of the economic and social organization of society depend from. They are the tools that allow a state to decide what economic policies it wants to pursue, uh, what kind of employment policies, what kind of investment policies, what kind of industrial policies, what kind of welfare policies, etc., etc. Only if you have those tools can you actually uh, choose you know, one model over another. Uh, can you really influence economic policy um, in a substantive way? So now it follows that um, only if a, if, a, if, a, if a nation is sovereign, uh, is economically sovereign, only if it has these tools can citizens, theoretically at least, choose between different models of society by choosing one party's platform over another, by choosing a platform that proposes more welfare over one that proposes less welfare, by choosing one party that proposes um, you know, pro-labor policies as opposed to one that proposes pro-business policies, etc., etc. Um, on the other hand, if a state is not economically sovereign, if it doesn't have these basic economic policy tools because, say, it has ceded them to institutions outside of the state, and of course any reference to actually existing institutions is uh, purely coincidental, then you, you can have the most formally democratic system in place where you allow anyone that wants to run for elections to run as many parties to, uh, um, to participate in the electoral process with the most radical programs, uh, you know, no limits whatsoever. But it will be completely useless because whatever government gets into power will find itself lacking the kind of basic economic policy tools necessary to steer the economy and society in one direction or another. And it will have little choice but to go along with the status quo or the policies that are decided by those institutions that actually do control those tools. In our case, the supranational institutions of the European Union and first and foremost, the European Central Bank. So, <clears throat> The EU is a problem, but of course the Eurozone is the real problem. Um, and that's because by joining the Euro, we, our countries have given up the fundamental plank, as I mentioned, of economic policy, the one that undergirds all the other uh, tools, and that's the power to issue your own currency. Um, as the late, great British economist Wynne Godley uh, said in 92, when the UK was debating whether to join the Euro or not, he wrote one of the most um, um, insightful articles about the nature of the uh, emerging monetary union. And he said, look, it would be a very bad, bad idea for the UK to join the euro because you've got to understand if you lose or if you give up the power to issue your own currency, you effectively uh, acquire the, state, the status of a local authority or a colony, Godly wrote. And he was right. Um, in this context, democracy becomes largely a charade an empty ritual which has hardly any impact um, on the substantive direction of policy, and that is the situation we find ourselves in, in the Eurozone. <coughs> and so this would be a problem, or should be a problem, for any Democrat, small d Democrat, um, but it is or should be a problem especially for those of a left or socialist inclination. Uh, that is to say, for those that favor um, a high degree of public or collective control over uh, the affairs of the market and the economy. I mean, if you're a radical, laissez-faire, free marketeer who believes that the government should, should stay out of the economy because you believe that, self, that market, markets are self, uh, 
um, regulating or self-equilibrating, then you might view this lack of economic this lack of economic sovereignty as not a big problem. In fact, you might even view it as something positive. But if you're a leftist, if you're a socialist, so if you believe in a certain degree of collective uh, um, control over the economy, then economic sovereignty becomes a fundamental precondition for political action. And in this sense, I think it's truly a shame that the European left has completely lost sight of this fundamental insight, um, instead embracing, with few exceptions, the anti-sovereign and therefore intrinsically anti-socialist project that is the European Union. Um, of course, this also has to do with the fact that the left has abandoned socialism more in general, so, but that's another story. Um, but I think what's interesting is that this hasn't always been the case. Um, there was a time when um, left parties, uh, socialist and social democratic and labor and communist parties in, in Europe used to get this, as, um, as, and, and left intellectuals too, as Greaves himself testifies. Uh, it makes me smile when people say that sovereignism is a right-wing or even a fascistic concept. Because my country, Italy, um, in my country, the most sovereignist party that's ever existed was the Italian Communist Party. Um, the only party uh, in Italian history to vote against every single European treaty, from the Treaty of Rome to 1957, all the way up to the Maastricht Treaty of 92. And they did so um, for a variety of reasons, but they, they, they did so because they openly said so, also because they understood the fundamental link between popular sovereignty, uh, social democracy, and national sovereignty. They understood that sovereignty within the state, so the sovereignty of the people, can only exist um, when there is a sovereignty of the state itself. So that they understood the fundamental link between these two uh, forms of sovereignty. And the same can be said of most uh, uh, you know, socialist or um, social democratic parties in Europe at the time, including the Labour Party, which, uh, as we know, was you know, uh, opposed to European integration up until the uh, late 80s, um, at least. And of course, that's when it all started going to shit. You know, that's, we know that story. Um, but it's true that for most of the post-war period, this was the position of the overall majority of left parties in Europe, uh, France, um, Germany, and elsewhere. And, uh, <clears throat> And they were right in the sense that the massive expansion of social and economic rights in the West in the post-war period was the result, of course, of a number of factors, including the existence of a living alternative to capitalism uh, in the form of the Soviet Union. But a crucial factor was the growing power of the, mass, of the masses, of the working classes, which were able to exert a growing influence over policy, uh, over the policy-making process, precisely because the states Western states enjoyed a high degree of relative, not absolute, but relative economic sovereignty. And, uh, and this is what eventually led to the materialization in the 1970s of the nightmare, at least from their perspective, that the original neoliberal thinkers, uh, people like Hayek, von Mises, Robbins, and others, had foresaw in the 1920s and 30s. What these original neo neoliberal thinkers were preoccupied by wasn't state intervention per se. Neoliberals aren't free marketeers. They don't believe in self-regulating uh, markets, as some people believe. In fact, they understood very clearly the need for a strong state, uh, even an authoritarian state, if necessary, in order to enforce market mechanisms and the interests of capital. What they really feared was mass democracy. So the entrance of the masses, the entrance of the working classes into the political arena as a result of the extension of universal suffrage. And at the time, this was quite a recent phenomenon, and in fact, it still is in some respects. Um, they rightly feared that a time would come when workers, being the, obviously the overwhelming majority uh, in, in societies, would become powerful and organized enough to uh, democratically opt out of capitalism. This was their greatest fear. And so they started you know, thinking about you know, what they could do about this, and, and they started devising solutions to avoid um, this outcome. They understood that, of course, mass democracy and universal suffrage was there to stay, and so you know, they couldn't frontally attack it, even though they were happy to support several uh, authoritarian governments uh, from time to time. But they came to the conclusion that the best idea would be not to frontally attack the system, not to frontally attack democracy, but to work around it. And the idea they came up with was globalism. And globalism isn't some right-wing dog-whistling term, as some people think. I mean, that's a term that they themselves use. 
is the title of the best book on the, on the, on the theory of these original neoliberal thinkers, which is called The Globalists. So it's a, it's a legitimate term for describing the ideology of, um, um, of, of these early neoliberals. And so the idea, in line with the kind of profoundly anti-democratic tradition of liberal thought, was to keep in place the formal elements of democracy, elections, universal suffrage, etc., etc., while at the same time insulating the economic decision-making process from democratic control. How do you do this? There are a number of ways of doing this. They thought the best way of doing that is if we, is if we find ways of constitutionalizing um, or locking in a specific economic model and specific economic rules at the international or even better at the supranational uh, level um, you know, through the creation, for example, of legally anchored economic frameworks um, that would prove impervious to democratic challenge, um, thus shifting slowly, even kind of invisibly, in a way that people wouldn't immediately notice, shift sovereignty away from the nation state, from the national level to the international and supranational uh, level obviously with the ultimate aim of limiting the ability of citizens to directly influence economic policy through the electoral process. So the idea was, you know, we'll take all the levers away, slowly, not all at, all at once, but slowly we'll start taking the levers out of the control room so that whoever gets into that room will find themselves in an you know, increasingly barren room um, and they'll realize they can't really do much. Um, as Quince Labodian, who's the author of the book I mentioned, The Globalist, uh, writes, the neoliberal project was focused on designing institutions not to liberate markets, but to encase them, to inoculate capitalism against the threat of democracy. So this is what neoliberalism as a political project, of course neoliberalism is also an economic project, but this is what neoliberalism as a political project fundamentally is about. And so an application of this, for example, in the interwar period was a return of the gold standard, which is one way in which you kind of lock in economic policies so that the margins of maneuver at the economic level for states is limited. Of course, following the Second World War, these ideas kind of fell into discredit, um, although they, do, they did play a role kind of in the creation of the so-called you know, post-war international liberal order. But in general, after the war, mass democracy and the integration of organized labor into Western political systems um, became the norm. And so the neoliberals kind of went into hibernation uh, for a while in their various academic departments at LSE and London or at the University of Chicago and elsewhere. But the ideas didn't go away. Um, in fact, they were revived and rediscovered by Western elites as a response to the crisis of the 1970s. A crisis that was at once economic, obviously, but it was also, especially from their standpoint, political. Uh, precisely because, as I said, the masses and the working classes had become so politicized that they saw a real risk of capitalism being democratically transcended at some point. And so just like the neoliberals of the 20s and 30s, the real problem from their perspective wasn't, you know, for example, the, the Keynesian economic model per se, it was democracy, uh, mass democracy. And they were quite open about it. Um, there's a famous um, report of 1973, uh, I think, The Crisis of Democracy. And it was a report put out by the um, Trilateral Commission, which was one of the many neoliberal think tanks that <clears throat> emerged in those years. And they explicitly framed the so-called crisis of democracy in terms of there being too much democracy, um, to which elites needed to respond by promoting, and I quote, a greater degree of moderation in democracy and a greater disengagement or non-involvement of civil society from the operations of the political system to be achieved also through the diffusion of apathy. So quite a straightforward program. They didn't miss their words. Um, and the idea was to promote de-democratization through um, depoliticization and de-sovereignization. And so in the removal or the insulation of macroeconomic policy from democratic control. And the globalist ideas of the 20s and 30s proved very, very useful in this regard. Um, so in fact, what we see in the 1970s is precisely the, um, the emergence of this international and then supranational architecture, as a result of which sovereignty starts to be shifted slowly from the national level to the international and supranational level, a level that is undemocratic by definition. Um, and of course, the most extreme manifestation of this was the um, European integration process, and especially the creation of the monetary union, which was a very long process. It's a process that begins with the creation of the European monetary system in 19, 
1979, and of course, culminates with the introduction of the euro in the early 2000s. And um, so it's important to acknowledge that the euro, the denationalization of money, of the currency, the most defining aspect, as uh, Godley um, often said, the most defining aspect of a country's independence and sovereignty, um, this is the most radical and extreme neoliberal experiment that has ever been attempted, which is what makes the contemporary left's support for it um, really baffling um, on so many levels. Um, it's also important to understand that this process of de-sovereignization and de-democratization wasn't imposed from above on national politicians by some evil European democracy, that, uh, a bureaucracy that you know usurped um, um, national powers. This was a, a, a process, it was a policy that was pursued by national politicians themselves, who sought to tie their hands, so to speak, as a way of escaping the pressures coming from below, from their own citizens, from their own electorates, uh, from the people. Um, in other words, by creating the external constraint of the European Union, of the Euro, they were able to pursue policies which they themselves wanted to pursue, while at the same time scapegoating the European Union. Uh, de-responsibilizing themselves. Um, and so it's the argument that we've heard very often. I mean, we hear it all the time in the Italian context, but I assume it's the same elsewhere as well. Sorry, it's out of our hands. This is what Europe demands. You know, it's not, we don't really want to do it, but you know, you have to because it's, you know, regulation one, two, five. Um, and so by appearing weaker, because of course, you know, it seems obvious that, you know, why would national leaders give up, willingly give up power? That's, because in fact, by appearing weaker, in fact, uh, and by actually giving up uh, certain powers, these national elites actually became stronger. They were more able to justify anti-labor, uh, uh, anti-socialist policies um, by using the scapegoat of the European Union. And so it, it worked also in the interest of national elites at first, of, at least. Of course, the problem is that in doing so, they also tied the hands of any future government that might have one day decided to challenge the European Union, as would then become amply clear um, through the Euro crisis. Another point to understand is that this process of de-sovereignization doesn't necessarily involve uh, a weakening of state apparatuses as such. And as I said, the neoliberals understood this well. They understood that capitalism requires a strong, even an authoritarian state in order to enforce market mechanisms, in order to enforce the rule of capital. And in a European case, states are obviously needed, for example, to materially implement the policies decided at the European level, at the supranational level, uh, to police uh, um, you know, workers and so on and so forth. And so even within neoliberalism, the state doesn't disappear. It remains absolutely central. It's just that it becomes anchored from democracy, from popular will, and states increasingly become just tools at the service of the interest of uh, big capital. Um, and I think the various crises that we've gone through over the past 15 years, the Euro crisis, the pandemic, the war in Ukraine, they exemplify these points very well. So the Euro crisis really um, um, showed the extent to which the EU exercises control over European uh, states. That was, of course, true even before the Euro crisis. The Euro crisis just made it apparent. We saw it here in Ireland when the ECB essentially forced the government first to bail out the, the banks at the taxpayers' expense and then to enter into a bailout with the, um, with the Troika, which included you know, very strict conditionalities in terms of uh, budget cuts, and you know, you know that um, all too well. Uh, we saw it in Greece when the ECB went as far as effectively shutting down the country's banking system, a completely unprecedented move in history as far as I know, um, just in order to get the Syriza government, uh, which had been elected on a precise mandate of overturning the EU dictated austerity policies, um, just to get the Syriza government to um, the heel and just to essentially you know, ended up forcing it to make a complete U-turn, despite even a, refer a referendum upholding kind of the, the, the electoral mandate, um, essentially forcing it to surrender to the European Union and uh, embrace the um, the economic status quo. We saw it in Italy, where the Berlusconi government, which wasn't a government I was particularly fond of, but nonetheless was effectively removed in what can only be described as a monetary 
coup, whereby the ECB, uh, in synergy, we even, because it's, they even admitted it now, with Germany, uh, so with Merkel and with France, with Sarkozy, deliberately raised interest rates um, in order to um, uh, allow interest rates to rise by stopping uh, purchases of Italian bonds, um, in order to <coughs> cause a financial crisis in the country, to force Berlusconi to resign and to have him replaced with the you know, arch technocrat Mario Monti, former European commissioner. Uh, and this has recently been admitted even by Sarkozy in his recently published memoir. Um, so what we're talking about, I mean, it's really important to you know, let it sink in. What we're talking about is a supranational central bank using its currency issuing powers to remove a democratically elected government by engineering a financial uh, coup, uh, as it did in Greece, or in this case by engineering a monetary uh, coup. I think it's, it's hard to, to imagine a more disturbing scenario, but th these, are, this is, these are things that happened you know, um, um, not too long ago. And again, one is reminded of Godley's uh, warning. If you give up the power to issue your own currency, you effectively uh, become a colony. And I think the, the euro crisis made that very clear. More recently, we had the case of the, kind of the populist government that was created in Italy in 2018, following the election of the, um, uh, the League and the Five Star Movement. Um, they, they, they created a government coalition. They had won basically on two proposals. The League had its yes, flagship proposal was a tax cut, and the flagship proposal of the Five Star Movement was an, uh, an income support scheme, uh, which Italy has always lacked. And, um, and so to this end, the government announced a tiny increase in the budget deficit, an increase of 0.2%. Not a 2% increase of the deficit, a 0.2% increase in the deficit. Uh, we're talking about you know, um, decimal changes in deficits, which aren't even usually calculated, because you can't, uh, you can't even calculate them uh, so precisely. Uh, and yet, this tiny <coughs> change was immediately met with the Commission's disapproval, which demanded for you know, the deficit to be uh, cut. And so this resulted in a six-month negotiation with the European Commission, which eventually resulted in the government caving in and ultimately collapsing shortly after, also as a result of, of this. And so I think this really shows just how limited the margins of maneuver for elected governments uh, are within the straitjacket of the euro. Um, and why I think there's no way such a system can be reasonably considered democratic. Um, uh, it's not only not substantively democratic, it's, 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 it's even less and less formally uh, democratic. Then, of course, we had the pandemic. And I think the pandemic was a different lesson. The pandemic was a lesson, um, it was a confirmation of the fact that the state doesn't go away under neoliberalism. It simply changes its nature. Uh, it transforms. And so after years of hearing of the waning power of the states, you know, states have no more power, completely useless, this is why we have to give more power to institutions like the European Union. Uh, so on and so forth. This has been a narrative for the past decades. In fact, we saw that uh, states can be um, very, very powerful. They can engage in, you know, they engage in unprecedented measures of uh, social control, social coercion, you know, even command and control policies, almost like Soviet-like you know, command and control policies in order to develop and then roll out vaccines in record time. Um, and so, you know, regardless of what one thinks of the pandemic management, I've also written quite a critical book uh, of the whole management called the COVID Consensus, if anyone is interested, but this is not what I'm here to talk about. Regardless of what one thinks of the whole affair, it really does signal that under neoliberalism, states remain very powerful. And in fact, they become uh, even more authoritarian in some respects, um, because they become immune to democratic pressure. And so, uh, you know, as a result of this decades-long kind of expulsion of the masses out of the democratic, um, of the political process, but that space doesn't remain empty. As with every void, it's filled in, and what we see is that this void uh, is occupied by other forces, uh, private actors, um, corporate actors. Uh, if we look at the actors that drove the pandemic response, we clearly see that you know, uh, ordinary citizens didn't have much of a say, but we know that international and supranational institutions like European Union and the WHO had a very big say. Private foundations like the Gates Foundation had a very big say. The corporate media, the capitalist elites, you know, big tech, big pharma, they all played a role in um, forging the response. And I think this exemplifies the changing nature of the state under um, neoliberalism. Um, 
So you can de-sovereignize the state. But that doesn't mean that, that means de-democratizing de it, but it doesn't mean necessarily making it um, weaker. And then we, you know, now we've had, um, we still have the war in Ukraine, which I think has underscored yet another dramatic element of this process of de-sovereignization, and that's the way in which it has led Europe to assuming a, an even more subordinate role vis-a-vis -vis the U.S., vis-a-vis -vis America in the Western hierarchy than it, than, it, than it had before, than it's ever had, I would say. Um, regardless of what one thinks of the war, um, there's no denying that it, it, you know, the way it's been, the response, not so much the war itself, the response of the West has led, um, um, has led Europe to become vassalized to the US to a greater degree than ever before in history, uh, blindly following America's strategy vis-a-vis -vis Russia and Ukraine, despite the growing costs in social and economic terms for Europe, you know, with entire sectors now experiencing dramatic process of deindustrialization, including the you know, former economic powerhouse of Europe, Germany, where there is explicit talk of deindustrialization uh, for a country that you know has uh, found that its very national identity on its manufacturing power. So this is how traumatic this has been. And so why have European countries ended up adopting this vassal-like attitude, apparently almost suicidal? I think there are a number of reasons. Uh, once again, we have to emphasize, I think, the role of the European Union, uh, which it's become clear that far from representing a counterweight to American power, it has proven to be little more than an appendage of American power. Um, an institution that is structurally wedded to the Atlanticist ideology, uh, which has long-standing institutional linkages to the US. In fact, we've seen the European Commissioner Ursula von der Leyen go out of her way to align the EU's policies with America's hawkish um, geo geopolitical strategy with regards not just to Ukraine, but also China and other issues. Um, no wonder von der Leyen has been dubbed by the magazine Politico, uh, Europe's American president. And, uh, and really, she, she, she's earned that title. She's worked tirelessly to align the EU to America over the years. And so I think we need to understand that the EU and NATO are part and parcel of the same system uh, through which the US exercises control through um, over the, the periphery of its empire, over its vassals. And I think this becomes even more apparent if we consider that uh, von der Leyen has already been chosen to take over as the next NATO chief. So uh, we can see the complete, you know, the complete symbiosis between the EU and NATO. It's, you know, we might as well speak of a single EU-NATO system. Um, that's effectively what it is. And I think that, you know, what the, um, what in a joint declaration the EU and NATO called the mutually reinforcing roles of these two organisations, I think it becomes apparent, especially in the case of the eurozone countries, um, in the sense that. As we've seen, the European Central Bank has no qualms about using its power to essentially engage in financial and monetary blackmail in order to force governments to adhere to uh, its economic agenda. And I think it's not too much of a stretch to posit that those same pressures would be applied even to um, a country that were to attempt to openly defy NATO uh, policy, especially vis-a-vis -vis Russia and Ukraine. And I think it's not a coincidence that the only um, EU NATO country that has really dared to defy um, the, 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 the EU and the NATO, NATO's policies over Ukraine is Hungary, which is not in the Euro. Now, one can think what one wants of the Hungarian uh, government, but it's, the point here is that they're, they're able to do that. They're able to defy, uh, to the extent that they do, the EU, EU policies and now even NATO policies because the EU has relatively little leverage over a country that has its own currency. So it's important there's a huge distinction between simply being in the European Union but maintaining your own currency and being in the Eurozone. Um, but there's also, I think, a more subtle consequence of de sovereignization and that's the way in which it has engendered an increasingly infantilized um, political class by largely delegating the management of their country's economic and foreign policies for decades now to uh, the EU and NATO and other uh, supranational institutions. Uh, this has created a situation where European politicians have uh, become really unaccustomed to uh, and unable, increasingly unable to engage in high-stake politics, in politics with a capital P, 
because they just acted as middle managers for so long, because the, the big decisions, the important decisions were taken um, elsewhere. And, um, you know, down the line, as you know, uh, the, you know the, the, the genes just kept getting, you know, uh, poorer and poorer. And so now you end up with, uh, you know, someone like Schultz, the leader of the most important European country, Germany, you know, acting like someone who's completely at a loss as to what to do, uh, you know, openly mocked as, you know, uh, Biden's lapdog. Um, and I think this is, you know, but, and of course, you know, the same can be said in a number of countries. Uh, there's, of course, there, there, there are a number of elements why politicians act the way they do. There's, there, there, there are financial and, uh, and, uh, and revo rewards of other kinds for, 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 for following the, the prescribed line. A lot of these politicians know that, you know, if they do as they're told, then they can go, they will find a lucrative job, you know, one, either in the European institutions or in some private sector. Uh, and some big bank, uh, you, the, the, you know, European commissions tend to go to banks after they've finished working there. Uh, depending, so depending on what role you have, then you know, they'll go place you somewhere. Um, but in general, I think there's also the fact that you know, these politicians really lack the intellectual and political um, ability to maneuver their countries in such a, you know, in a, in a, in a context in which you know, we're back into high state, very high state politics. You know, politics couldn't be more dangerous than, than they are now, as we you know we, we face the potential prospect of a nuclear war. Um, and they're completely unable to engage, you know, they're terrified of having to do real politics. Um, uh, politics with, uh, you know, such high stakes. And this makes them easily, um, um, easy to manipulate. Um, and, and so I think this, this is, this, so I think this is one maybe of the most, um, I think, pernicious consequences of this process of the depoliticization and desovereignization, just the way it's impoverished um, European um, political classes. Um, and so I think in general it's important um, to tie together the struggle against the European Union and the struggle against NATO. As I said, I think they should be viewed as a single system. Um, now more than ever, those institutions, I think, have revealed themselves for how just how dangerous um, they are, um, and so you know one would hope that the current crisis might provide the occasion for the emergence of a new uh, pro-sovereignty, pro-democracy, uh, pro-peace movement. Um, at the moment, we're not seeing much of that. In fact, we see um, um, you know pro pro democracy pro independence uh, even pro peace uh, movements in retreat everywhere uh, in europe um, this has to do with this i think wider process of depoliticization uh, as well um, they've you know as the 1975 report uh, from the trilateral commission said we have to make people apathetic or they might have been a bit too successful in making people apathetic and and, and, and of course you know we're all suffering as a result of that the complete disengagement of people from the political process is isn't just a result of you know new changes in you know, the emergence of new technologies and so on and so forth as we are often hear. I mean, of course, all of that played a role, but this has also been the, you know the, the result of a deliberate process of depoliticization. They wanted to make people apathetic. They wanted to expel people from the uh, political um, process, and now this is the the result the situation we find ourselves in is one in which our societies can't muster the energy to respond to these massive um, crises that we're facing. And um, so this is the negative side of the story. Um, but I think if we widen our, our gaze beyond the borders of, our, of, of the West, which is you know, revealing itself to be a relatively small island uh, in the world, then I think one's view uh, might change. And I think the global context might offer reasons to be uh, optimistic. If we look um, beyond the borders of the West, we see that countries everywhere in the global South are starting to assert and stand up for their sovereignty, for their um, uh, independence, and to cha challenge the kind of Western-led global um, order. So while, you know, um, the, the, the pro-sovereignty and pro-democracy and pro-independence uh, movements are all in retreat in the West. They're massively on the rise everywhere else. 
And I think this is a um, this is potentially um, uh, a positive um, evolution, um, and I think it represents um, again potentially a great opportunity also for Western countries wishing to um, assert their sovereignty as well. Um, the emergence of this multipolar order, um, I think, opens up new windows. Um, so, you know, potentially, I think the, 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 the space could be there to relaunch these, uh, the, these movements. I mean, there's, there's really no reason to remain under America's heel when, you know, the rest of the world is already building a new kind of post-Western international uh, order um, is already challenging. So much weaker countries than our countries are challenging American hegemony everywhere. Uh, in the world, um, and you know, we we for the time being don't seem to be able to do it in in our own countries. But I think the global context does um, give us reasons to be uh, optimistic. I think this is a global um, wave. Some have even termed it kind of a new decolonization movement. And to the extent that uh, you know we need to decolonize ourselves in Europe as well, I think this could also be. Um, uh, amidst the tragedy, I think this also offers uh, some reason to be uh, optimistic about the future. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. It's always, it's always good to end on, a, on an optimistic note. I thought we should end on an optimistic note. Yes, a lot of what you said have echoes here. I, I've always said from my own, from my own experience that, um, you know, um, a big factor in this, which is like the public are aware of it, but um, is the is, is the actual benefits for individuals inside the higher levels of the public service, whether political or on the civil service side, to um, to row in with this? Um, you know, why do they pay people in Brussels so much extra than than national civil servants? I, I remember at a meeting of of um, I, I use the term senior civil servants. I put forward a proposal that anybody who negotiated with the European Union should be barred for five for five years from taking a job. And I literally thought some people were going to have a stroke. <laughs> Any job. Any job. <laughs> and they said, they said, uh, but who could do it as good as us? You know, we we got to do it. The other thing uh, I think is very important, and I won't drop it on because the audience here is, you know, the role of the media. It's very difficult for parties here in this country to, to project any degree of, of skepticism about Europe without the media coming down on them like a ton of bricks. And you know, there are reasons why um, um, billionaires buy newspapers. It's not for the, for the profit margin of it. Um, there is a, there is, it's very, very difficult to get over any alternative view in this country without being um, cast as a nut or a conspiracy, a conspiracy freak or something like that. And I think the fact that the media has become, and you mentioned Politico, and Politico is very, very propagandist, and yet is, is, is put up in, the, in, in Europe as an authentic and, and um, genuine journalistic organization. But a lot of what you said you know, rings true in this country as well. So I'll shut up at this stage and I'll take a number of questions. You you can answer them individually or if there's a group of them, we can we can group them together. So I'd like to open the floor to questions. So this, this man here.